I'm here to introduce uh, Professor Patrick Deneen, who really needs no introduction at Baylor. He's been here several times before. He holds an endowed chair of political science at the University of Notre Dame. He's the author of two books and the editor of three more. Uh, his two books I can, I can personally recommend, The Odyssey of Political Theory, was originally his dissertation, written under the late and great Wilson Carey McWilliams. It won the Leo Strauss Award for Best Dissertation in Political Philosophy. The year it was written, which I think was around 93. Came out as a paperback in 2000. His second book was Democratic Faith, which came out in 2005. He's edited three, three others. Um, two of them focus on the writings and ideas of his teacher, Wilson Carey McWilliams. He has another edited volume coming out very soon. It's called Conserving America? Question mark, and it will be out, I think, within a month or so. Um, and that's running alongside his, his next major project, which is a book uh, called Why Liberalism Failed. that will come out at Yale in 2017. Uh, Patrick is the author of many wonderful articles. You'll see his pieces appear in first th places like First Things, The Imaginative, Conservative. Um, he does lots of things with Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Um, he's a wonderful speaker, and you're in for a real picture show because uh, this, will, this will have slides to have images to back up what he's saying about art, architecture, and culture. You can see the title of his talk right here. Please welcome Patrick Deneen. Thanks very much, David. Uh, it's, it's really a delight to be back here at Baylor, uh, especially given the, the current weather in South Bend. It's a nice treat to be here. Sit outside last night having dinner. And I'd also like to thank the Institute uh, for Faith and Learning for once again inviting me back down here. Uh, and Darren, if you're here, if you want to make this a regular thing, I, I have my calendar with me, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to come down every, every fall. Uh, his, uh, faithful vision and deep commitment to uh, serious intellectual exchange, as well as fostering a real community of friends, um, as well as scholars, uh, is a real uh, exemplar of what, uh, what I think can and should happen at our universities. So I want to talk today about kind of what, what surrounds us often that we don't necessarily always take notice of, the places or spaces uh, in which our work unfolds. When, uh, if you, probably this time of year, you probably see gaggles of students walking around campus, or gaggles of prospective students walking around campus. Maybe some of you younger folks rem remember this, uh, where you're kind of walking, probably trying to stay a little bit far away from your parents, uh, who are really embarrassing you most days. Uh, and you'll see students walking around in a kind of pack, led by someone who has the ability to walk backwards. And what they're doing is generally looking at buildings. Uh, when you take a college tour, uh, in most cases, you get kind of an anodyne presentation about the institution. You know, we, we care about learning and critical thinking, and you'll become a great person. And then most of the tour tends to consist of, here's a lot of buildings that we have, and aren't these nice, and don't you want to come here? Most prospective students will not step into a classroom that's actually in which teaching is being done before they matriculate. Uh, rarely, if ever, will they imagine this, looking at a list of faculty that you might take classes with and try to figure out, like, I'm going to go read their work to figure out if I want to study with these people, um, much less uh, to ask to interview with the faculty uh, before you consider enrolling. I've had one or two students, I think prompted by their parents over the years, out of the thousands upon thousands that come up to look at colleges, who come to meet with me and sort of just want to ask, what's, what's really going on here inside of these buildings? Rather. They spend their time walking by and sometimes through administrative buildings, dormitories, dining halls, lecture halls, at least the empty ones, gymnasiums, and more often than not, libraries. And many of them, maybe even most of these students, along with their parents afterwards, will talk about what they liked about the campus, which will often be reduced to a kind of feeling that they had about what impressed them, about the kind of the beauty of the campus, the feeling that they got, the vibe that they got, uh, uh, in terms of whether or not they will make it their home for the next four years. Now, on the one hand, we might and maybe should scoff at the superficiality with which students can often evaluate colleges. But at least on one point, at this point, their reactions deserve some credence. The buildings that they spend their time looking at were in fact built with a view of teaching them something. More than merely just walls, 
with doors and windows and roofs and plumbing and HVA systems and sometimes beautiful chandeliers. These buildings are themselves already a kind of text that is intended to convey a kind of teaching to students and to everyone who occupies or spends time in a university before they ever enter a classroom, before they crack a book, before they have their first late night conversation. In fact, we could say the buildings are the most constant teacher on a university campus. They are constantly there as a presence and operating at even a subconscious level on the minds of students during their entire time of schooling. In this sense, they are more permanent than even those teachers that they might take multiple classes with or the majors and minors that they will pursue. James Davison Hunter concluded his lecture last night by talking about the deceptiveness of the appearance of solidity that campuses present in their built environment. He stated, and I tried to write this down as quickly as I could since it seemed to touch on what I'd be talking about, I think nearly verbatim, and I'll, so I'll quote, that bricks and mortar give the appearance of solidity, but that we don't need to be taken in by appearances, he said. He went on to quote from Nietzsche from the Gay Science that buildings on our campuses are often museums to dead ideas. And while I agree with him in part, what I want us to discuss with you today are also the live ideas that are present in the unsilent stones that populate our campuses and what they aim to teach us about ourselves and what they are teaching us and our students through them. Now I speak to you here today not as an expert on architecture and nor do I even play one on television and yet having lived and worked at institutions of higher learning for just about 20 years, 19 years now, I've gained at least a knowledge born of the curiosity of an amateur and the experience of someone who's hung around long enough. But what I'll try to do today is to couple that with my expertise as a political theorist in thinking about what our buildings aim to teach us, and in particular by focusing on libraries. In fact, the, my first interest and thoughts about this uh, um, approach came when I visited Baylor about three years ago in 2012, initially for this conference in the fall and then a subsequent invitation by Professor Hibbs where I actually, ha having reflected on my experience walking around campus, tried to be be begin to articulate some of these thoughts uh, during a convocation of the Honors College. At the time I was teaching at Georgetown University and as I walked around the campus at Baylor, I was struck by one remarkable similarity between our two campuses that I have now discovered to be the case at many, many campuses that I've visited over the years. So I'm, what I'm going to do is to uh, subject you to the kind of thing that grandparents used to subject their children to, which is to show them a slideshow of their vacation in Europe. Uh, and I'd like to show you some of the things that I saw during my many tours of colleges over the years. And what struck me in particular was how execrably ugly libraries were, campus libraries were. This began for me uh, in uh, having taught at Georgetown University uh, where I would have occasion uh, in my classes uh, when confronted with student claims that you couldn't judge between beauty and ugliness, between claims of taste, uh, that in fact I would ask them, which building do you prefer on campus? Do you prefer Healy Hall or Lowinger Library? And students would hem and haw, or maybe not even hem and haw, but they would say, well, Healy is much better than Lowinger, and I'll tell you, I'll give you some sense of that why in, a, in a, just a moment. But what struck me as well was that libraries weren't always ugly. In fact, libraries were often the most beautiful building on campus. Let me give you one sense of this. This is the Georgetown Library. That's not in use anymore. This is now used for ceremonial occasions, the Riggs Library, which is housed inside of this building, Healy Hall, the main building on the campus of the University, oh, sorry, of Georgetown University, built between the years 1877 to 1879. Now this is not the library that I would point out as the ugly library that, are, that should be an exemplar of why taste is not merely subjective. Instead, I was pointing to, sorry, to this building, Lowinger Library, built in 1970. 
a building uh, that is widely viewed as the, uh, the eyesore on campus and which occupies a particularly remarkable spot of geography on the Georgetown campus overlooking the Potomac River. And so this is actually the view, not quite the view, but, it, but if you're across the Potomac River, this is what you see across the Potomac River, the rear side of the uh, of Lowinger Library. What struck me as well is that, uh, as you can see, the, the, what you see on the outside is reflected also when you go inside. This is uh, an older picture when, Lowen, uh, when uh, Riggs Library was in use, when it was actually used as a library um, by, by students and not simply as a uh, ceremonial event. And here's the interior of the Lowinger Library where our students now study. So this is what they used to study in. And that's what they study in now. When I visited Baylor then in 2012, I was struck by a similar contrast, perhaps not quite as brutalist, but nevertheless striking, that in addition to the Moody Memorial, Memorial Library built here in 1968, there's the F.L. Carroll Library, right down, I think that way, uh, built here in 1933. And of course, also the Browning Library built here in 1950. That's the, this was the original self-standing library here at Baylor, the Carroll Library, now the, the home of the Texas Archive. And here is the Moody Library, taken from a particularly, I think, fetching angle. <laughs> it sort of looked a little better today. Maybe it was nice and bright outside, but, uh, uh, but that, I like the parking lot especially as uh, um, kind of a nice contrast. The interiors, again, I think reflect some of the aspects of the exterior. Here's the interior of the Moody Library, at least as of some time ago. And the, uh, I should have gone over earlier today and taken a better picture of this, the interior of the Carroll Library. Uh, maybe a better example of an interior, a beautiful interior space on campus is the Browning Library, uh, which if you haven't visited, if you're a visitor to campus, you should take that opportunity. Now, when I show pictures such as these, trying to uh, uh, reveal, once again, here's Moody, uh, to reveal the, the striking contrast. What I will typically be told is that, well, the reason for this is just that architectural styles had changed oh, between these years. And my reply to that is, yeah, is, well, duh, to quote my students. Well, duh, yes, architectural styles changed. But of course, that answer begs the question of why they changed and why they changed in the way that they did and to what end. And this is where I think the discipline of architecture uh, as, a, as a discipline uh, will tend to need the help of other disciplines, philosophy, theology, and today as a political theorist. What is the library? Well, we know it's the place we keep books, sometimes, although later in the, later, later in the slideshow, I'll even show the ways in which that may not be the case anymore. The library, of course, is or has been at the core of the university's mission and its life. It is literally the building that stores the past, that stores the accomplishments of past generations, as well as their errors. It is the storehouse of memory. The library is that most visible space on campus where we see the thing that differentiates human beings from the beasts that in spite of the many similarities that we share with all creatures, that perhaps the one overarching thing that differentiates us from other creatures is the fact that human beings can remember past their own lifetimes, and that we have the capacity to pass along our memories to future generations. The library, then, is the visible sign of the thing that makes us human, our distinctive humanity in its most crystalline and essential form. Human beings, perhaps we could say above all, are the animal of homo culturus, we could say, the cultural creature or the cultural animal, that we need culture to survive more than even our various technologies that we talk about today. The thing that makes it possible for human beings to survive uh, that we lack otherwise. We don't have great speed, great strength, uh, the gifts of flight or being able to swim beneath the seas. But what we do have is the capacity to pass on knowledge and memory and experience from one generation to the next. And libraries have been historically the bearers of culture, 
Perhaps that, again, most representative example of the bearer of culture, along with that more experiential form of family stories and traditions passed on from family or within communities. The Greeks understood this. The Greek goddess, Menosomy, the goddess of memory, is thought to have been the mother of the nine muses, the mother of the goddesses of culture. Previous generations understood the central importance of the library, and along with the chapel, invested in them not only great effort, great exertion, at times when building was not even as easy as it is today, and also, of course, a great deal of money, but sought to make them the most beautiful space on campus. That when a student would enter the library, that student would feel a sense of awe and reverence and gratitude and humility and inspiration. These were the temples of our intellectual life, temples of the fact that we are cultural animals. And in the case of Baylor University, these two functions were literally combined, at least for some period of time, when it was called the F.L. Carroll Chapel and Library. The chapel was on the top floor, I guess, until the Great Fire of 1922. But following a revolution in views about education, part some of which were talked about last night by James Davis and Hunter, libraries came to occupy a very ambiguous place on college campuses and an ambiguous place precisely because of the thing that they were and the thing that they were to represent. This transformation included one in which institutions that had understood themselves to in some ways be stewards and care caretakers of the knowledge and experience that had been won by the past, that had placed a place of pride upon the classics, upon the great books of the past, those great Greek and Roman classics as well as the Bible that instead institutions should become forward-looking, liberated from the past, advancing progress and valuing the new over the old. A main figure in this transformation was, of course, that great philosopher of education, John Dewey, the intellectual architect of modern education whose ideas transformed and, influ and influenced a change in actual architecture. We could say that the change in libraries that I've been showing you is in some ways the evidence, the physical evidence of the change of intellectual architecture that underlie the changes in our built environment. Traditional education's focus, Dewey said, uh, had led to a kind of impasse or a dead end. He called for the dismantling of what he called traditional education in favor of an education that conformed mo more closely to the times of change and transformation that he argued were the hallmark of his time, the beginning of the 20th, 20th century, into the middle, middle part. Traditional education's focus especially upon transmission from the past in the form of books was especially problematic in Dewey's view. Dewey's, among the, his uh, more famous achievements, was the creation of what, what's still called the Lab School uh, next to the University of Chicago. And it was purposefully called the Lab School because it was a school where you would do experiments. You wouldn't spend time reading old books. You would learn things for yourself. You wouldn't read about the Pythagorean theorem. You would do the Pythagorean, I'm not sure how you do that, but you would, you would see how it actually worked by discovering it yourself. In his short book, Experience and Education, he wrote that such education, a traditional education, assumes that what must be learned is, and I quote, essentially static. To go on to quote him, this form of knowledge is taught as a finished project with little regard either to the ways in which it was originally built up or to changes that will surely occur in the future. It is to a large extent the cultural product of societies that assumed that the future would be very much like the past and yet is used as educational food in a society where change is the rule and not the exception. Right? So people are learning in some senses, they're learning in such a way in which what they're learning no longer matches the world in which they live, in which a previous generation assumes certain things about the world that no longer apply, in which the young in some senses are smarter than the old. They, they're more in touch with what is happening in the world. We see this in part when you try to fix a computer in your house. 
you know, if something goes wrong with technology today, you always go to the youngest person in your house, not to the oldest. And what Dewey is saying is that we should not have a kind of deference to the ancient. Dewey then called for an education based upon direct engagement with the contemporary problems of society and also emphasized the need to eschew education grounded in the past in preference to one that actually itself generates more growth and more progress and more change. Having a faith that more progress and more change would in fact better the world. But this of course then left that core campus institution, the library, in a particularly ambiguous and precarious place. While still an essential part of the university, its traditional role was now, of course, downgraded and even suspect. It was the visible remnant of an alternative view of education that was now being widely discarded and even being regarded as one of the vestiges of an age of hierarchy and oppression and backwardness. Without being able to rid themselves of libraries, what could campuses do? The answer, of course, was to reflect the transformation of educational philosophy in the buildings themselves, and especially to use the demand for the expansion of campuses in the wake of the GI Bill following World War II and the general growth of higher education that we have seen at least until recent times that would reflect the new commitments of Dewey's call for progress and growth, or the later call mentioned last night by Clark Kerr, the, form, the president of the uh, University of California system, for the multiversity to directly serve the economy and American national security. This meant the need to demote the libraries even as they were built bigger and grander, to reflect at once their orientation toward progress, even as their formerly sacred dimension or the sacred nature of their role was shorn from these new buildings. The older purpose of the library in some ways was to be encased a little bit like uh, Han Solo, right? Encased in, a, in an external frame and into a modern and progressive shell, one whose very rejection of beauty and whose embrace of brutalism would convey simultaneously the diminished importance of the role of books in education while underscoring these older institutions' commitment to progress and to forward looking. These new structures thus hid, in some ways, the purpose of the library, encasing that older university within, its, within a modern carapace, and thus presenting in stone the argument and the conclusion that even this most traditional aspect of education was, in fact, wholly modern and progressive. I'll give you another example of this. This is the uh, Hill Library at uh, Louisiana State University. I think I saw Rod Dreyer back there, was he? He was here briefly, I drove him away. I thought I'd do this in his honor. This, is a, this was a library built in 1903. Uh, in 1958, no, sorry. In 1958, uh, the Hill Library was replaced by the Middleton uh, Library. This new design, I think among other things, reflects a commitment to utility and to usefulness, again echoing James Davison Hunter last night, proof of the university's relevance as a direct contributor to the economy and to national security. The exteriors of such buildings were often bland and unadorned, the equivalent of warehouses, showing that they are workmanlike and on the job, not frilly and adorned, hence wasteful and lazy like the buildings of yore. The, the exteriors of such buildings are, were increasingly made of what we would, might say as base substances, often concrete, the material that is, was at least at that time most often used for sidewalks and for streets, the material that you walk upon, as opposed to what once was once reserved for the, the, the finest, the most exemplary buildings on campus, those quarried stones such as marble or granite or even brick often with stone highlights in the frames and the windows and doors. A good example of a base material, again, to go back to Lowinger, and one of the things that always struck me about Lowinger is that the material matched exactly the pavement uh, that you would be walking upon as you walked into the library. The interiors, of course, reflected this com commitment even more so. No distractions, no adornments meant to attract the eye 
only spaces where the job should be completed and one should seek to abandon as quickly as humanly possible. This is the interior of the LSU Middleton Library. I'm, I, I'm not surprised that it's empty. And this is the interior of, it, of the older uh, Hill Library uh, at LSU. Do we also emphasize, John, do we also emphasize that libraries central role as the conveyor of culture also meant that they were part of a longer tradition that promoted what he viewed as a static view of the world. Remember those lines where he said that the future, is, uh, that in such a culture, people assume the future would be very much like the past. In this sense, we could say a culture, in this understanding, helped people to learn to live in a world in ways that ensured continuity. Culture, in Dewey's view, was a sign of resignation to the world as it was and needed to be put aside in favor of a more progressive view of transforming the world in order to meet the needs and demands of humanity. In another book on education by Dewey called Democracy and Education, Dewey describes two ways of existing in the world. One he describes as that of the savages, and that's his term which reflects a culture that has learned to adapt itself to the world, especially the natural world, living in a similar way generation after generation, a way of living in which your great-great-great-grandparents could come back and they would find things to be fairly recognizable, as could your great-great-great-grandchildren. Dewey writes that, and I quote, the, the savage's lack of control over natural forces means that a scant number of nat natural objects enter into associated behavior. Only a small number of natural resources are utilized and are not worked for for what they are worth. The advance of civilization means that a larger number of natural forces and objects have been transformed into instrumentalities of action, into means of securing ends. Dewey was not well known as a great stylist of prose. But his basic point was that savage people don't use the world to the ends, to the best ends that they could. What makes a people savage, he went on to write, is its, resigna is its resignation to conforming itself to the world. And I quote again, its adaptation involves a maximizing of accepting, tolerating, putting up with things as they are, a, ma a maximization of passive acqui acquiescence and a minimum of active control, of, subject, of subjection to use, end quote. He goes on to write, by contrast, I quote again, a civilized people who might live in a similar situation. He, he's writing about, for example, living in a desert. A civilized people introduce irrigation. It searches the world for plants and animals that will flourish under such conditions. It improves by careful selection those which are growing there. The savage is merely habituated. The civilized man has habits which transform his environment." End quote. Dewey's argument then, we could say, is undergirds, among other things, ushers in the advent of the research university. A university which is transformed from one which sees its fundamental role as passing a culture on, of passing along the hard-won knowledge of the past and rather understands its role and its mission, as to use the phrase most often used, to create new knowledge. And in particularly through the ascendant disciplines of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The university would thus become increasingly an anti-cultural institution, one that would seek in some ways to eviscerate, mostly indirectly, uh, existing cultures, often in the name of multiculturalism, in order to advance and extend human mastery and the conquest of nature. Strikingly, it seems to me, we can see this commitment to the mastery of nature reflected in the design of these new libraries themselves. That, again, these texts are effectively teaching its students, its faculty, its visitors about its deepest philosophical commitments. So often these new buildings are not only marked by a brutalist ugliness, a utilitarian design, and a use of base materials, 
But architectural features of these buildings demonstrate that these buildings are no longer subject to natural forces in ways that traditional architecture sought to highlight. Traditional architecture, many of its design features, seek to highlight the way that it is respecting the forces of nature, the way it is showing us how nature is in some ways being conformed to, how gravity is being respected, how the fact of weather and conditions of weather are being respected. For example, the need to make the top of buildings narrower than the bottom of buildings. That's the way you respect gravity. This is what every child learns usually after a minute of playing with blocks. Right? If you try to make you know, the top of the tower uh, wider or even as wide as the bottom, the blocks will fall down. Similarly, those parts of the, uh, of the design uh, of the design of a building in which you have a hole in the side of the building, a, a, a window or a door, uh, in the traditional form of architecture would be highlighted how that hole was being sort of kept up or how something that would jut out from the building itself would be held up typically through pillars. A good example of this is the Harper Library at the University of Chicago. We see among other things that uh, some of its Maybe I had a pointer here, but we can see how some of the sides, the, the, the ends come out wider and flare out. Uh, we see how the arches of the windows highlight the way in which the windows are being held up. And of course, the battlements rising to the top show us that the top is narrower than the bottom. By contrast, uh, here again, a different picture of that building. Again, all of the various highlights and features of a traditional building which show us how the forces of nature are being, in some respects, respected. This is the Regenstein Library at the University of Chicago, uh, built in the 1960s. And one of its distinctive features, it always seems to me, is how it becomes wider as it goes up. Notice how it's built in the opposite way that you would, a child would use blocks. The bottom, actually, the cantilevers become increasingly wide as you move up. Here's a good close-up of that. Regenstein Library is demonstrating to us that it no longer has to, in some senses, respect the forces of nature. It is an existing testimony to the fact that we have conquered those forces of nature. We no longer have to give any due regard to them. We can say that this form is also shown in the, shown in the interior of these buildings as well. This is the interior of the Harper Library. An extraordinary, stunning building. When I attended the University of Chicago, I always studied in the Harper Library. This is why I'm now speaking up here. I became profound and smart in ways that I couldn't if I was studying inside of this building. All right. uh, this building, uh, I suppose I could, you could say it has pillars that show us how it's being kept up, but uh, uh, let's just say it's not as quite as demonstrative as the Harper uh, interior. And Harper, uh, also in the interior, shows us how the arched windows are holding up the, hall, the, the, the holes in the walls and the arches on the ceiling are also demonstrating this as well. You can see this same element at work at a number of other universities. This is the Alden Library at Ohio University, not the Ohio State. This is Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, in which the bottom of the building has the pillars set back. And you see the building coming out further. Right? If you're a, somebody who's walking under this building, you might want to be scared unless you have confidence in the human capacity to conquer nature. As the building goes higher, the element of the building comes further out. By contrast, this is the, uh, this is the original library, the Carnegie uh, Library at, the, uh, at Ohio University. Here, there's uh, notice that the bottom of this building, uh, while not literally pillars, the building seeks to emphasize the ways that something is holding up the top of the building, so that the bricks are uh, indented in the inside so that the kind of pillar look can be emphasized to give us a confidence that something is holding this building up and something is holding up these windows as well. The typical architectural style, also you can see the door has, these, uh, has the pillars that show us how that porch or that small portico is being held up as well. All of these various redefinitions, I think at their heart, were premised upon a fundamental transformation of what it was that the universities were dedicated to achieve. The classical university and the libraries that inhabited them focused on the liberal arts. And of course, by focusing on the liberal arts, the emphasis there was upon the learning of a certain kind of liberty. At the heart of the word liberal arts is the word liberty itself. 
Liberty, of course, was understood in the classical and Christian understanding, not as that condition that we enjoy in the absence, in the absence of obstacles that might prevent us from achieving our desires, but rather in the taming of desire itself, its governance through reason and through the cultivation of virtue. The ancient texts that were assigned in the liberal arts tradition were assigned not merely because they were old, there were many old books that were not assigned, but because they contained hard-won lessons about how difficult it was, but how possible it was to learn the art of being free. You would read the Odyssey, for instance, the book that I wrote my dissertation on, in part because it tells us or shows us how Odysseus can only, in some senses, achieve his homecoming, achieve his membership in his community when he comes to accept his own limits, ultimately his own mortality, his decision to decline the offer of immortality of Calypso and to accept the mortality that he will share with Penelope. And that freedom is also born of the humility and the submission of the Christian tradition that rather than placing at its core mastery and control, we have passages such as that in Philippians 2.8. Have, have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count himself equal to God. He did not account equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient even to the point of death, even on a cross. The embrace of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, especially its application through technology, reflects rather, by contrast, a deeper commitment to a modern form of liberty. The modern understanding of liberty as the expansion of human mastery over objects that might prevent us from gaining what we desire from preventing our will to be able to do as it wishes in the world. That old liberal education, and with it the old conception of liberty, must be displaced for a new conception. And existence, the existence of that presence of that old understanding of liberty is a standing insult and accusation to the new understanding of liberty. We see this, of course, in these aspects of the libraries that I'm talking about. We can also see them in the transformation of some of the mottos that are used. Another way universities represent themselves. Ohio University, for example. At the time that this library was built, its motto was religio doctrina civilitas pre omnibus virtus. Religion, learning, civility, and above all, virtue. Whereas if you check today for the mission statement of the Ohio University on its homepage, you will read the following. Ohio University strives to be the best student-centered transformative learning community in America, where students realize their promise, faculty advance knowledge, staff achieve excellence, and alumni become global leaders, exclamation point. Ohio is the university that fits what you, capital letters, want to become, and what you, capital letters, want to be. It's the place where you can be yourself. You can become your best self. That's what virtue has become, above all. Or consider the University of Texas. I'm here in Texas now. Let's honor, I'm sure, one of your beloved institutional partners, the University of Texas, its old university, the Battle Library. Was replaced some years later by the PCL Library. I think the P stands for prison. Here's the interior of the PCL. Here's the interior of the old library battle hall. PCL and the old library. The original motto of the University of Texas, which still is its model, was Disciplina Presidium Civitatis, which was actually a translation of an English motto, which President Mirabeau Lamar had coined as the following, and this I think might be one of my favorite college mottos of all. A cultivated mind is the guardian genius of democracy. A cultivated mind is the guardian genius of democracy. But notice it's translated into disciplina presidium civitatis. A disciplined, a discipline presides over the civil order. Right? Cultivated mind. 
Today's homepage, among other things, mission statement states that the university contributes to the advancement of society through research, creative activity, scholarly inquiry, and the development of new knowledge. Always the development of new knowledge. The new, always better than the old. So we have been freed, our libraries show us we have been freed from the past and freed from the definitions of liberty that once confined us. But increasingly it seems to me that the tools of our liberation seem to have turned us into its tools. Those tools that were to free us from the old and from the past. Our government, the economy, technology. These things that were supposed to be the tools that allow us our freedom increasingly seem to shape us and even use us. And this includes our education. Students that I encounter increasingly in these years are filled with a kind of cynicism toward their education and toward their participation in maintaining an order that they know they can't avoid, but which they do not trust. Far from, in my experience, far from believing themselves to be the most liberated and autonomous of any generation in the history of the world, my experience with young adults is one in which they believe in their task even less than that of Sisyphus when he was rolling his boulder up the mountainside. They exceed in excellence in the duties that are demanded of them by their elders, but without real joy or love, but with a keen sense of having no other choice. Their overwhelming response to their lot, which has been expressed to me in countless responses that I've asked of them to talk to me about what they, what they think about their education, their expectations and hopes for their education, is one of entrapment, of having no exit, of being cynical participants in a system that produces winners and losers with uh, keen accuracy and with keen hopes that they will be among its winners, but at the same time that they pronounce loudly that they are in a system that is a vehicle of social justice. As one of my students just this fall described the lot of her generation to me in a short description of her ceaseless striving in school and then in college and beyond, and I'll quote from her, we are meritocrats out of a survivalist instinct. We do not race to the very top. If we do not race to the very top, the only remaining option is a bottomless pit of failure. To simply work hard and get decent grades doesn't cut it anymore if you believe there are only two options, the very top or rock bottom. It is a classic prisoner's dilemma. To sit around for two to three hours at the dining hall shooting the breeze, or to spend time engaged in intellectual conversation and moral and, and philosophical issues, or to go on a date, all detract from time we could be spending on getting to the top, and thus will leave us worse off than everyone else. Because we view humanity, and thus its institutions, as corrupt and selfish, the only person we can rely upon is ourself. The only way we can avoid failure of being let down and ultimately succumbing to the chaotic world around us, therefore, is to have the means, financial security, to rely only upon ourselves. If they feel themselves to be living in a kind of prison, perhaps we have been building the buildings that reflect their condition. Now, Darren Davis, in his introduction, said we don't have the luxury of lament. Can Christian institutions offer something better? Can we offer a truly higher education? Can we point to the sacred among, amid the brutalist? And here I have my worries. The Christian institutions, I showed you already some of the pictures from Baylor, but let me, let me indict my own institution. Here's our original library, Bond Hall. There's our library now, which has its virtues. It's got a big picture of Jesus on it, but look at it from the angle without Jesus. It's not all that much better than many of the other buildings. Uh, the Christian schools have been seduced by the same stories of liberation and dominance as the secular schools. Uh, and so we are equally challenged, it seems to me, in understanding and finding our way outside of this kind of a prison. I, I think it's, you know, look at how few windows there are. It's actually really extraordinary. But I think at the same time, at the, very, at the very least, we can begin to take some comfort in what hasn't been done. And let me say a few kind words about Notre Dame, I guess interiors. There's our, where our students can study. This was built, this landed next to the University of Chicago a few years ago. Uh, this is a spaceship called Mansueto, in addition to the Regenstein Library. Uh, this was built uh, as a 
uh, an annex of the Regenstein Library. And one of the most striking features of it, when you look at the inside, what do you notice that's missing? There are no books. It is a library that has overcome, of course, the need even to have or contain books. I'm told that they're all stored underground. Now, Notre Dame also was tempted by the space age uh, and um, nearly, nearly built a few buildings that I think we would have regretted had we, had we gone forward with those. The first of these were plans, the original plans to build a new library, not the Hesburgh Library, that's a tall structure with a touchdown Jesus on it. These were the original plans where the new library would go. Is anyone Dr. Solomon? I see Dr. Solomon out there. Do you know where this is? No, that's not. Can you see what's over? That's where the main building was. So the thought was the main building was old and it was hard to maintain. So they were going to tear down the main building and put this up. I think some administrator in a basement somewhere said, well, maybe we don't want to do this. But this was drawn up as a plan, uh, and there were some serious thoughts about uh, undertaking this. Uh, Notre Dame students will be known as the space cadets rather than the, golden, uh, rather than the domers had this happened. Here's the other project, and this is the one that David was referring to. Uh, these, this was a set of dormitories that were going to be known as the Mod Quad, uh, and they were going to tear down the existing chapel to put up this uh, spaceship. Uh, so this was proposed to be the replacement for that, and that would have been, the space needle would have been the replacement for the chapel. So what can I conclude from this? I think in, in, in what's, what should at least give us some hope is that we haven't torn down the main building at Notre Dame in the midst of a, a craze for the new. We haven't torn down, Baylor hasn't torn down the Carroll Library. All of these institutions, I think without exception that I showed to you today, they all still have their older libraries and in, in their own ways they all regard them as beautiful spaces. There's no denying that they're, they're spaces of extraordinary beauty. There's simply an undeniable fact that when you confront and you see beauty, it is inspiring. And it draws you out and it draws you back into that feeling of awe and reverence and even sacredness that was their original intention. And that even uh, when one is tempted, as the University of Notre Dame was, to tear down uh, such, a, such a beautiful building such as the main building or our chapel, that something perhaps, uh, even amid, uh, against the spirit of the age, prevented them from doing this. The fact that these libraries continue to exist on our campuses, even if they're tucked away uh, in corners of the campus that few students will visit, perhaps will never even enter, uh, perhaps forgotten by and large, uh, nevertheless exists as a continuing testimony to their existence, that they can be rediscovered at any time. In all likelihood, we face a future in which we will have to build the equivalent of older libraries in our new campuses or to fill them with a spirit in which they were originally built. And I suppose this is my own answer to the question that James Davison Hunter was trying to answer last night or that Rod Dreher was talking about uh, this later this morning, which is what is to be done, particularly as a Christian in a time uh, that is so challenging for us. And I suspect even in our Christian colleges, places like Baylor and Notre Dame, perhaps especially that aim to be players in the national stage, that we're going to have to in some ways create Christian communities and understand that we may not run these institutions, that we will be the equivalent of the old library on campus, but place that's still an opportunity, a place to visit and to be inspired. We face less, I think, the realistic task of making, remaking the university today. I think that perhaps ship has sailed at least for the time being, than preserving a space on our campuses for an alternative, at least for the foreseeable future. The urgent task is to keep these buildings open, to keep these teachings alive, not to allow them to be turned into museums of dead ideas, and nor to allow the spirit that animated them to be buried amid the wreckage of the world that we have created, but in which we do not have to consent or agree. I'll leave you finally with 
the picture that adorns the rotunda underneath the dome at the University of Notre Dame that would have been torn down. A beautiful image I always ask my students to go find uh, at some point during the semester. Uh, and each of those symbols represents one of the liberal arts surrounding uh, our, our Lady and the Holy Spirit. But it is religion surrounded by the arts. I think this is a, an apt symbol for what it is, what kind of education we might aspire uh, to give our students and for, for which they hopefully they might yearn. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Professor Deneen would like to take your questions if you have any. I don't want to. <laughs> I will. Yes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Can you? So I don't know if everyone could hear that question. Yeah. No, it's fine. Um, uh, so the question was uh, the. Don't hesitate to come up to the mic if you'd like to put your question so that we can hear this it. This one. This okay. one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question uh, uh, was that was question about uh, uh, whether whether we should take um, uh, conclusion that the fact that uh, the libraries are empty as a sign that um, uh, the in some ways the original purpose has been uh, uh, largely literally emptied, uh, that students today are more drawn to uh, learning through and with their computers online, et cetera. I guess I would, I would begin by challenging the basic premise, um, which is, again, I, have, I, don't, I don't have universal knowledge of this, but I find when I go into the library at the University of Notre Dame, for example, it's not a beautiful space, but it's often quite full. Um, and I'm not sure, I see a number of young people, is, is that the case at your libraries? Nodding yes, so maybe, maybe it's less the case that they're empty. It's often the case that they're fullest like at, at, at uh, 10 p.m. and afterwards. Uh, so maybe people like us are not there at those times. Um, I think there's a, libraries are really still remain places of a real gathering of students. Uh, it's one of the places where they meet each other. And of course, one of the ways that libraries have changed to meet that need is they've, opened, they've turned themselves into sort of 24-hour cafes and restaurants. Um, I saw the, the, um, uh, the Moody Library has a Starbucks here, um, which I plan to avail myself of very soon. Um, but uh, uh, so that they're, they're serving students both in various, various forms of nourishment. But I think what one of the things you say is true, which is that it's decreasingly the case that libraries are used for books. Uh, that uh, students tend not to want to use books, own books, keep books, move books. Uh, books are seen as in some ways a kind of, uh, you know, something that's gonna weigh you down. Uh, but most of what you can uh, uh, learn and need can be gotten through some form of electric medium today, electronic medium. And I would say in response that I tell my students uh, just a couple things. Uh, I encourage them, first of all, to think of books as, as friends uh, that, that while they're heavy and annoying, like sometimes like real friends, uh, they nevertheless can accompany you your entire life and can be of surprising assistance to you when you least expect it. Uh, and to have a collection of beloved books is to always have that kind of those friends to surround you. Uh, and that you can turn to them and 
reacquaint yourselves with them. And what's striking about really the great books is they will always have something to say to you at a particular moment of life where you didn't realize that I needed to find this in this book at this time. I didn't see this in this book when I was 18. And I'm seeing it now. And secondly, uh, the second thing I tell them is that they should be um, looking for books in the library because of all the surprise discoveries you can make. And, and much of the great, some of the greatest experience of my undergraduate time were, I actually worked in the library, so I did a lot of reshelving of books. Uh, and the fantastic books I would discover that I never would have found if I hadn't been in that particular row and just happening to be glancing at some of the spines of the books and just pulling down, that title looks interesting, and pulling down that book and finding out that this was really something I had to read. So I would say in this sense, I don't know that the libraries are empty, but I'm also not sure that uh, in terms of especially the, uh, what, they, what they are to convey in terms of a a storehouse of a kind of wisdom, or a storehouse, a treasury of the past, that that is adequately being taken advantage of by students. And that's as I, I think they are very much creatures of the age of the internet. And um, uh, one of the things that I've begun doing, I uh, actually took a piece of advice from Bill Kavanaugh, who's out there, is encouraging our students that if you really want to try uh, to exercise some kind of discipline over your appetites, uh, which used to be um, fasting from food. Try to fast from electronics for a day, maybe during Lent for a few days, um, uh, that uh, uh, you might discover certain things about the world that you didn't realize before. So, thank you for your question. Yes, sir. I can say uh, quite firmly yes in the case of Notre Dame. And it's one of the, one of the things I'll crow about, uh, about Notre Dame. Notre Dame School of Architecture is, I think, really one of the standout schools uh, in the landscape of Christian higher education. Uh, the faculty is, I think, across the board pretty solidly um, devoted to the restoration of classical architecture and is training a, gen a new generation and new generations of students uh, to appreciate all the various elements that went into, of course, the, the uh, creation of beautiful buildings that we still appreciate. Um, my very good friend and colleague, Philip Bess, uh, Professor Bess, who has season tickets to the Cubs and is not taking me there uh, for the next few nights. I guess I can't blame him. Uh, he has family. Uh, um, but my friend, my dear friend Philip Bess uh, is, I think, one of the most interesting thinkers in terms of also thinking about not only buildings, but the built environment, what we now call new urbanism, which, as Philip would be the first to tell you, is old, ur old urbanism. New urbanism is old urbanism. Right? Thinking about um, how we not only shape and create our buildings, but how we place those buildings in relationship to so many other buildings, and how the exterior of buildings then create spaces, this beautiful promenade that you have out here in this older part of Baylor University. Clear thought on how you would create spaces. And one of the things that strikes me outside of this building is how many students are gathering out there. That feeling of being, uh, in some ways, um, you know, embraced in the safety of the walls of the buildings that surround these spaces is a very deep, a deep felt human need to feel that we're talk about safe spaces, to feel that we're in some ways embraced within a kind of a space that itself has a definite form, as opposed to just a couple of blocks from here trying to walk, is it on uh, um, just toward the highway over there, if you want to go to the Jack in the Box, and you would not want to walk there, um, even if it was you were in the apocalypse of the road, uh, you would try to avoid walking in that space as much as possible. So to think about the spaces that we create through our buildings, in addition to the way that we design our buildings, is something that, that the Notre Dame Architecture School has spent a lot of time thinking about. And uh, one of the problems, though, that, that they tell me is that no one is essentially interested in hiring their students to teach. That uh, even though they're training this new generation uh, in uh, the classical forms of architecture and the classical forms of building, there are very few schools, Christian or otherwise, that are interested in these forms of building and these forms of design. So uh, we're hoping, uh, a number of us at Notre Dame, that we can begin encouraging some of the universities, Christian universities that do have architecture schools, to make a similar move, uh, to begin to build a movement in which we can uh, really uh, have a, a series of classical, Christ, uh, 
Christian university architecture schools um, devoted to the classical forms of architecture and sacred architecture as well, which is also a strength at Notre Dame. So it's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for that question. I, I've, I've had a conversation with a lot of people over the years about this, this interest of mine. Um, and, and I've taken these examples from campuses that I've visited that, again, as, I, as I've gone to more and more campuses, have, have shown this kind of pattern, that typically um, there will be a newer library that was built at some time in the 60s that reflects many of the things that I was discussing. Uh, and then I'll always say, where is the original library? And most of the time the response will be, what do you mean? Uh, most people aren't even aware that there was an original library. So we have to do a little bit of research and, and we usually find it's, you know, it's a museum or it's been turned into an archive. Um, it's some place that people tend not to visit. So I, I, you, you yourself used uh, the word pattern, pattern as a, as a way to describe what I'm describing here. And I would say that that's that's what I'm attempting to say that it is. Now it's a pattern based in social science language. It's a pattern based on a very small n, which means a number, but we have to use n so it sounds scientific. Uh, so it's based on a small n, uh, which means I can't claim that this is somehow some kind of comprehensive description that you'll find on all or 90% of college campuses. And I suspect that, that it varies widely as college campuses vary. But the fact that it occurs on as many as it does uh, and it occurs with fair regularity, is to me really indicative that there's something going on here that's worth trying to excavate. And this doesn't deny for, the, you know, for a moment that there are going to probably be as many exceptions to this rule as there might be examples of the rule. Um, so I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't regard any of those as, um, uh, as disqualifying. It, 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 I, I find it particularly interesting that it that it's often takes place with the library, but you can almost, you said at Yale it has its examples. You can always find other evidence of it. At Princeton, uh, where I used to teach, the library is actually quite nice. Firestone Library is very classic. It was built in the 20s. and They built it big enough uh, that it wouldn't have to be replaced by something else. Uh, but if you want a real example of, uh, of, of the kind of design style that I'm talking about, that, this is the greatest uh, symmetry of all. Go to the Princeton Architecture School which is just hideously ugly. Uh, it is really, it's just, uh, it's worse than, worse than any of the buildings that I showed up there, except for maybe Lowinger Library at Georgetown. Uh, so there's always an example, typically, of something, some, uh, some building that went up. Uh, as to your St. John's counter example, I would simply say, yeah, I mean, that's St. John's, right? I mean, St. John's is itself a very exceptional institution. But I would say the following, maybe the library isn't quite as essential at St. John's because the place is all about books. You know, you don't have to teach somebody coming into St. John's, books matter here, because you go to St. John's. 
because books matter. That's why you're there. There's no question that, that you're there. And secondly, well, I guess at St. John's, you only read like 12 books, so you don't need a big library. So. <laughs> Hubris. Great, thank you. Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, two questions, well, I, the, one question in two parts. Um, the first part was really pressing me on, on my brief mention of, uh, of the Odyssey and the way in which we could look to that as a kind of classical text that teaches a, a certain kind of understanding of limits and what it is to be a human. And the second question was, how did I get here and uh, um, how do I plan to get home? Uh, <laughs> uh, was, uh, uh, what, 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 what's wrong in some, some ways with pushing back natural boundaries and, for example, in this case, gravity. Um, so you're, I mean, just, just, to the, just to the broader point of the question about um, whether I'm correct about the classics in some ways teaching, teaching a kind of uh, understanding of, of limits, I, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the, the, one of the great things about so many of the classic texts that we continue to read and reread, the kind of St. John's curriculum, is that there are always, um, so many of them have at their heart the question of, given that we have no um, instinctive knowledge of what our limits are, it's not given to us by instinct, how do we know when we have reached them? Right. Uh, now, I think in general you could say most of the great classical texts acknowledge that there's some limit in many ways, they, that's part of what part of what they're teaching, uh, but they also acknowledge that it can be very difficult to know where it is. Uh, so, in part, the the great texts are teaching us how difficult it is to be a human being, right? 
They're saying there's, there's no, right, if, 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 if this was easy, if there was a handbook, if there was a, uh, you know, sort of a how-to book, you wouldn't need all these years of education. You wouldn't need to go through all these years and read years and read all these books. It's actually very difficult to know how to be a human being. And that's part of what these books seem to be teaching me. Teaching uh, is how difficult it, that kind of knowledge is. And secondly, that as much as, it, as they are aiming to sort of teach us a kind of capacity to, to understand, at least to strive to know our limits, it also seeks to encourage a capacity and effort to understand why we should seek to strive and to excel, right? Uh, and, you know, not to plug my dissertation necessarily and the book that came out of it, but uh, I really, this was really the tension that I wanted to explore was, the, was in some ways, um, it seemed to me that much of the Western tradition had understood the Odyssey in two ways, that it's uh, a book about liberation, about Odysseus being his own person going forth, and precisely the, the passage you mentioned, he doesn't stay home for very long. Uh, or that it's, a, that it's a book about, you know, that ultimately that limits have to be understood and known, and whether Odysseus actually does know those. And so in some ways you could read the Odyssey by as saying, okay, he does learn those limits. Dante, in, in famously in, in the Inferno, says, well, he turns out he doesn't, and he presses beyond where he should go, uh, and he's sunk as he reaches the, uh, the, the foot of the Paradiso, that he tries to go too far. He does, have, he does ultimately show a kind of hubris. Uh, so here's a, here's a great text talking about a great text and, and commenting upon that. So it, it seems to me that, uh, that at least part of what the great books education sought to do in the classical understanding was to be, have that, aware, that tension in, at the forefront of our awareness, but not resolving or easily resolving that tension. And I would further argue, and you can read this in an essay that I wrote called Against Great Books for First Things, I would argue that the hallmark of the modern tradition in many ways, in, encapsulated in many of the great books of the modern tradition, was to say that the effort to discern what the limits are was a, was a, uh, was a lesson that we, don't, that we can essentially discard. Uh, that we really are really fundamentally creatures that should seek to overcome what we once thought of as limits. That that should be the, the modern project in particular. Uh, so flight, you mentioned, is one of those. Well, yes, I flew planes to get down here. I didn't, don't do it gladly. I would actually say that we should have more conferences that, that accumulate more of our own faculty, but I'm glad to be here. Don't, don't disinvite me, Daryl, uh, Darren, but, um, uh, but that... Um, but that uh, it seems to me that one of the things at least the ancients would, would teach us, or the ancient lessons would teach us, that, that these achievements, these pushing beyond what had been limits, do not come without cost. That the, that the, the great achievement of human flight has cost. Right? And those costs, I mean, we could say those costs are environmental, for certain. Right? We're seeing feedback from nature all over the place. Right? Uh, and that uh, those costs could also be in terms of how we understand ourselves in relationship to our communities, the way in which we understand ourselves primarily as creatures of mobility. Right? Odysseus at least struggles with the idea of homecoming, do we, in the same way? Or do we understand ourselves first and foremost as creatures who are above all educated and oriented toward leaving home? I often tell my students that unless you come from one of about three, maybe five cities, I used to say five cities, unless you come from one of five cities in America or maybe 10 around the globe, that if you go home after you graduate college, you will be regarded as a failure. That people will say, what, you know, why, you know, why did you go home? Why didn't you go to live in New York or Chicago or LA or, or London. I once said, I once said when I was teaching at Georgetown, I once said, if you come, unless you come from five cities, and I had a student raise his hand, I swear this is true, raise his hand and say, what are the other two? What are, what are, there, there aren't five cities he would choose to live in. So I, one of the things that um, one of my the authors that I admire, Wendell Berry, has said about modern education is that the one thing we teach students is upward mobility. It's the one thing they major, major in with a heavy emphasis upon mobility.
It's a good question. I, I, I mentioned having, I won't, I won't run all the way back to find it, but I mentioned having studied uh, when I was at Chicago at the Harper Library, uh, but, but the cost of that was that the seats were actually really hard. Uh, they were, they were, what's that? Yeah, I, okay, that's fine. I, I haven't actually been into it yet, so. Um, agreed. <laughs> Nothing could be worse than Regenstein. <laughs> But I, I, I used to study in Harper, and it was very uncomfortable. Um, so I would have to get up every once in a while and walk around and kind of relieve the, the stress of the, uh, of the hard seats. Um, but one of the things that struck me about that um, was that I, I was saying that um, one of the ways in which the interior of so many of our modern buildings, especially these ones that I was showing, are designed in some ways not to, not to encourage us to sort of glance up. You know, like this room, I think could pass as a room where we might want to just kind of look, right, and just reflect on what it is we're seeing, what it is these various architectural elements are, are showing to us. And I, and I take it that in part, um, you wouldn't, the, part of the reason why there were relatively uncomfortable seats in a place like Harper, A, you know, people weren't, as you say, they weren't as obsessed with creature comforts, but also that there was something meat something right about um, occasionally sort of feeling like I have, to, I have to look up. I have to look up from my work. Um, whatever it is that I think I have to complete, whatever assignment I have to complete, I have to view it in the light of the space and the surroundings that I'm in. And my eyes should be drawn outside of the narrow range, and to, and, and at least into the intermediate and even longer range. Uh, and this is certainly true, of course, one's experience, I mean, I'm Catholic, I'm not so sure I'm on the Baptist campus, so I might be speaking out of turn here, but certainly the churches in my tradition are designed that you spend time, you know, maybe your, maybe your attention wanders when you have that boring sermon, but it ain't bad because you're looking at some incredible, usually at some very beautiful symbols, and symbols meant to inspire you, and symbols that are meant to deepen your understanding of your faith. So even to be looking around sometimes in what we might think of as, as distraction is a good thing in such a context. Whereas to do so when you're sitting in Regenstein Library or sitting inside maybe those, you know, some of those other interiors, the PCL and, and Lowinger, to, to have your mind wander is to say, I'm, I'm now wasting time. Right? Because it is. Because you're, nothing that you're going to see in your surroundings is really going to be all that edifying. Right? So... I'm not sure that speaks directly to your, to your point, but it, it does seem to me that there's a way in which the, 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 our, the way in which so many of these older uh, constructions often were accompanied by you know, less than plush circumstances were one of the ways that you were encouraged and allowed to let your mind wander in its own way to have a kind of leisure, right? And we don't often associate a hard wooden chair with leisure. <laughs> but, uh, but it seems to me that there was a kind of deeper understanding in, in such context that leisure wasn't just sitting as a couch potato in the plushest chair in which you were more likely to fall asleep while, while you were reading Homer uh, than ever finishing it. So that's a great question. I hadn't really thought about that before. I appreciate that. Guess maybe we have time for one more. So, sir.
Thanks. I guess I, just the one, the one point that you made um, initially, I think in, in almost all the cases of these schools that we're talking about, they were poorer institutions when they built those older buildings. They had, they had less money then. So I don't think it's just a matter of money. I mean, obviously, it, it is a lot cheaper if you build out of concrete than if you build out of marble. But it was so important to those institutions, even when they were at their poorest, that they would build in that style. So I don't think it's merely a matter of money. It's simply where you're going to put your money. Yeah, so, well, I, 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 I think it's fair to say so many of these schools, certainly Notre Dame was a lot richer at the time. It was not, not rich, rich, but it was, it was uh, wealthier. Um, but yes, to, to the main question on, on nostalgia, um, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I think one has to be wary of, of over-idealization of some perfect past. Um, that, yet I guess I, I um, without, without engaging in nostalgia, I think, it's a, it's a concern to me that the places that I've taught Princeton, Georgetown, and Notre Dame, I have seen a steady decline in basic knowledge of some of these great texts and traditions in our students over the 20 years that I've been teaching. And I think that's in part a reflection of educational, differences of educational priorities. They simply, many schools, high schools and otherwise, simply don't spend as much time in assigning the old texts. Uh, they, there are many other texts and lessons that they teach. I think they are much more in the throes of Dewey's vision of what, what a school should be. Um, and I see this as a, in, some, in some ways as a, as a kind of theft by the elders, that we are not uh, giving them uh, the, the gift of what their own heritage and tradition is. Now, they, they and, and the elders, I think, don't see it that way and say we, we, we're giving them other things. But it seems to me that what we are doing whether we want to say it or not, is that we are preparing human beings largely shorn of any cultural inheritance who will be perfect tools within an economic and social system that demands people who have no culture. Indeed, that which, which, which uh, benefits from people who have no firm commitments or guideposts, ethical, moral, or otherwise that it actually is to the advantage of the broader economic system to have such people and the training of such people. So I don't regard it as a nostalgia for some golden age when our students had a firmer culture. I think there was at least some residual aspect of that even 20 years ago when I started teaching. Um, but that um, it's, it's, a, it's a requirement of a civilization that wants in some ways to produce, I think it was James Davison Hunter said yesterday, uh, the, even the, the dean or president at Johns Hopkins University is worried that they're producing um, perfect barbarians, was I think something went along the lines that he had to say. Um, and and at the, attendant to that, I actually think that, that such, at least such, the, the presumption of the carrying of a certain culture is one of the greatest barriers and protections against a certain kind of elitism. It seems to me that, that students who, who come out of our top universities today are every bit elitists. They are gonna be operating in an economic, social, and political order that's gonna have, uh, the, in which their particular kind of training is gonna be of immense benefit, but they will see no relationship to, and indeed, if you listen to them, have no relationship to people who live within you know, 30 miles of where they live. Who, who, in theory at least, are their countrymen and denizens of their own culture, but whom they largely believe that they have no, bear no relationship to. So I think it actually it promotes a form of elitism to essentially produce graduates, especially at these top universities, but not only, um, who have not been encouraged to understand that they are part of a larger story and narrative and fabric in which they share lives with other people who even if they didn't undergo that same kind of education, that they share their lives with them. So I see it as in some ways a kind of buttress against a certain very virulent and dangerous form of elitism that I see being produced with extraordinary uh, um, efficiency by our leading universities. 
but I thank you for your question because it is something that I do also have to remind myself and worry about, um, and it's one that we should worry about. I thank you for that. And thank you all very much for your attention and time.